Hey guys, I'd like to welcome you back to my channel. Today I got something on my heart I'd like to share with you guys. Um, it's a teaching that I've been studying for quite a while. Um, I tried to record this last week and the week before, and I've had a lot of hardware problems with my camera and my hard drive. So I'm going to give this a try again. Hopefully you enjoy this teaching. Um, make sure you have your Bible ready with you because I'm going to go through a lot of Bible verses. Today's teaching is about false teachers and false prophets. So I'm going to be very careful on what I say because I don't want to teach falsely. I want to teach the truth. And uh, I want you guys to know some things because we are in the last days and the coming of the Lord is near. And uh, the Bible talks about false prophets and false teachers in our time. And he also talks about some of the signs and the things going on in the world that makes us get ready to look up because Jesus is coming back. So it's important that you guys understand some of these things because there's a lot of apost apostasy in the church today and it's only going to get worse. So we need to protect ourselves and stand on the Word of God. So I'm going to turn to... 2 Timothy chapter 2 and read verses 15 to 16. I'm going to be using the New King James Version Bible. So you can follow along. It's pretty close to the King James. It just doesn't have the these and thous in it. So Scripture says, verse 15 of 2 Timothy 2, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. So you'll notice in my videos below, there's no way to respond. Like uh, There's no chats or messages, because people that put the comments down in the video section, it ends up going back and forth and back and forth, and nothing is profitable from that. You know, we pick and chew each other apart online, and it's not, it's not good. So if you do not agree with what I'm saying then just disregard it. But um, if you read your word and you listen carefully to what I'm about to say and you're in agreement, then let the God speak to you through his word. Don't believe anything I say on this video, but c compare what I say to the word of God and whether it be true or whether it be a lie. So you should always take your Bible with you and open it in church and look up everything everybody teaches you because there's a lot of false teaching out there. And because I have a platform here and I'm on this video talking to you, doesn't mean you should trust me. You should always look up the things that I'm saying. Make sure that they line up with the Word of God. So, And it's the same as me when I'm around other people. I always go back to the Word and make sure what they're saying is true. And I always confirm it with the Word of God. So another scripture we must read before we continue is, Too many people claim to be false teachers and false prophets. And according to my notes, what I wrote down, there's so many famous speakers out there, people who claim to be called by God. And you'll notice they have many books written, much knowledge, some hidden truth about the Word of God. You know, and, and sometimes they seem special and chosen and above the crowd. But they're just as human, just like you and me. So let's read, uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and read verse 12. So Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. And further, my son, be admonished by these, of making of many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome of, to the flesh. So you got to be careful how much information you stick in your mind from all these different sources because you can get confused. You know, many people teach the same topic and have different views and unless you actually go to the Word of God and read everything in context you're gonna get deceived so Satan in these last days is using technology to propagate his false teaching and, and the false prophets before 
some of these churches used to do this and before the internet and nobody knew about it. But now that it's proliferated everywhere, it's so easy to get out the teachings, false teachings and the false prophecies because anybody can get on a camera and say what they want. So you got to be careful. Satan loves technology. Satan uses these platforms as well as the local pulpit in your church to propagate lies. So even the pastor of the church can be vulnerable to this decep deception because Satan likes to use leadership. You know, the Bible talks about a pastor being a shepherd, protecting the flock, just like Jesus protects the sheep. Um, and a pastor's responsibility is to protect his flock and his church. And if Satan can get to the top and get it through the pastor, he can get to the flock. So that's why... The pastors are twice accountable, held accountable to God, because their position is of high honor, but it's also of high responsibility, because all the members in that church trust the pastor and what he's saying. And when he brings in other material from the outside into a church, and it's not, it doesn't line up with the Word of God, he's going to stand accountable before God. Now we're going to be looking at the size of the churches and the size of the congregations. When I was a younger Christian, I used to think, wow, look at the size of that church, and look at all those people in there. And I was untrained, I was unlearned, you know, I was new, and I thought for surely the bigger the church, the bigger the congregation, the more, you know, God's there, right, the presence of God. But that's not the truth. The truth is that God uses the, 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 the humble things to bring Him glory, like he doesn't need a huge church or a hockey arena full of people. Just your local community church, you know, with a group of 20, 50, 100 people. Like, God works through those types of churches. So sometimes the bigger churches are not good. They, they have a lot of false teachers and false prophets in there. And they grow big because people are drawn to the, to the lust of the flesh. And what they teach on those pulpits is to gratify your flesh. You know, what I mean by that is, is uh, instead of preaching about sin and repentance and living a holy life for the Lord, they teach about what God can give you. You know, you bless your business, bless your family, give you health to your flesh. It all has to do with tempor temporal things, things that are going to pass away. And people are drawn to that. And some people believe that if they follow the Lord, they're going to get blessed. You know, and you can't take that message to a third world country. Because they're going to laugh at you. Like, you tell them, yeah, God's going to want you healthy, wealthy, and prosperous, and they're going to look at you like an alien because that's not the truth. But if you take that message to Canada or North America, well, then, you know, everybody's you know, not as poor, so they're going to believe it. So, anyway, it, it's all lies. You know, it's, I'm not here to judge people, but anybody who propagates those lies, they themselves alone will stand in front of God at the judgment. And give an account and I won't be there and they won't be there for my judgment so I'm not going to name names on this video but I'm going to give you information and the Word of God so that you can discern between a false teacher and a false prophet from what is real so according to my notes um, beware of the false teachers and the false prophets they're seen everywhere on TV and radio on YouTube all over the internet just like the Pharisees at Jesus time they look beautiful full of religion consider the buildings they teach in and the church buildings are huge monstrosities consider the size of the church and how much it gets used each week some of these churches are millions of dollars and they get used once a, once a week and then they're closed for the rest of the week. You got to figure, like, Jesus Christ didn't need a huge church to preach the gospel. He, he didn't even have a place to live. And uh, even, uh, well, Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, but he carried the money bag for the Lord. And when the temple tax had to be paid, he told his disciples to go down to the water, catch a fish, and the coin that they found in the fish's mouth would pay the temple tax. So he wasn't rich. He didn't have a Jaguar, a jet airplane, 
lived in a mansion that could support hundreds of people when he, when he, when the house that he should be living in should only support the area of maybe one or two people. That's all access in Scripture. Jesus went to the Pharisees and said, You look beautiful on the outside, but in the inside you're dirty, full of dead man's bones. First clean, once the outside of the cup and dish, clean the inside of the cup and dish first. For inside you're full of excess and indulgence. So your life is full of too much excess and indulgence. And how do you know false prophets and false teachers? Look at where they, how they live. Do they live like Jesus? Or are they full of excess and indulgence? That's how you know a true believer from one that's a false teacher and a false prophet. Because people who truly believe in the Lord Jesus don't seek after riches on the earth. They seek after God's glory, God's approval, a kingdom that's not made with human hands. Anybody who has the hope of the Lord coming back purifies themselves. They have that inside them. Because they know that this kingdom is not their home. Their real home is in heaven, you know, with a new body. And uh, the Apostle Paul talked about that in the New Testament. So if you have a Christian who's living in excess, you need to ask yourself a question. Where's their heart? Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. So, And some people worship God to gain advantage, to make money. And Jesus said, what does it profit all the whole world if they gain their soul? Sorry, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? What would a man do in exchange for his soul? So, money is okay. It's just... Do you worship it over God, right? So, anyway, my notes say, uh, let's continue here. The greater st the structure, the greater the fall. What that means is, in these ministries, they get so big. I'm sure at first when they started off their ministries, you know, they're on fire for the Lord. But once the ministry gets big, corruption enters in. And then they got to maintain so much money to maintain the huge ministry. And then they start doing things that they wouldn't do normally if they were didn't have that pressure. So the corruption creeps in. And then, you know, Satan gets in the door and wreaks havoc. But I'm sure all these big ministries started off small, you know, and had a heart for God. But then over time, they got corrupted and fell into the way of the world. So... Let's see here. Something you should consider. Did Jesus live like them? Where did Jesus call home? Did he teach in a million dollar hall or church or concert? How about after his teaching? Where did he lay his head to sleep? He didn't have a place to call home. Did he fly his dedicated airplane to his next location? No, he walked. And he was so humble that he took a donkey into Jerusalem. Did he drive a Rolls Royce to the next town? Obviously these questions are no. So these people do not live like Christ. They justify their means to an end, saying that, you know, that they need this or that to do the, the will of God. But the truth is they don't need this stuff. But man's flesh is corrupt and evil. And they're going to try to justify it by using God's word and twist the scripture. But it's it's really bad. So let's see how God sees man. Samuel was to seek Saul's replacement as king, as King Saul disobeyed the Lord and God rejected Saul. In this story, you can see the character of God and how he sees man. So let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and we'll read verses 2 to 13. So if you got your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we're going to read verses 2 to 13. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? 
And he said peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and, and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And so it was when they came that he looked at Elab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the, Lord's, the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. And we are not to look on the outward appearance either. This is important you understand this. Verse 7 says again, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Verse 8. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send to bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. He was ruddy with bright eyes, good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Ramah. I want you to see that God sees the heart. He does not look on the outside. And do not be deceived by looking at big churches and big congregations. You need to look to the Word of God for the truth. Because the size of the church is big doesn't mean God's there. That's the whole point. So uh, let's go on to the next part. Do not be deceived by visions of heaven. Prophecies about wars and prosperity of nations. Or even by people who say, the Lord is telling me to tell you something. You get a lot of people with that are moved by emotion today. They feel like some type of little feeling in their body. And they're like, surely that's the Lord. Or they get a dream and the next day they're like, they better tell everybody about the dream. And God didn't tell them to tell people about their dream. But they go ahead and do it anyway. And they say, the Lord told me to tell you. Or the Lord gave me a vision. Or the Lord did this. Or the Lord did that. And you got to be careful what you attach the name of the Lord to. Because God is holy. And people who do this do not fear God. They do not approach Him. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. We have to approach Him in a godly reverence. But they don't see God through the eyes of some of these prophets. Like John, the apostle, who fell dead before the Lord. And the Lord put His hand on him and said, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I which was dead and am alive forevermore. He fell dead before the Lord because of he's a sinful person and God is so holy. There's many other prophets in the in the Old Testament that fell before the for the Lord too. Isaiah, Jeremiah had a vision. Daniel got sick for many weeks when the angel showed him the vision. Like the reaction to the presence of God because he's so holy and we're so sinful, is our bodies just fall apart. So we need to approach God with fear, with reverence. Because he deserves that. Because he's a holy God. And he's not like us humans. Like, we're created in his image, but he doesn't think like we think, you know, and talk like we talk. He's above us. He's in the heavens, and we're down here below on the earth. And we think we can do things and not even consider that God's up in heaven, right? He it's his, this earth is his footstool, it says in the scripture. So and he sits on his throne, he's sovereign. So we gotta honor him. So let's see, um continuing on some people have rapture dreams or trips to heaven and hell. People like to uh come out with a book saying they went to heaven and saw Jesus and saw all the prophets and all this garbage, lies. And nobody's gone to heaven, guys. 
Uh, the only one that went to heaven was the Apostle Paul. He had a vision, and he couldn't even describe what it was like in heaven. He says, I can't even utter the words. It's not allowed for human beings to utter words in heaven because they're just so holy and sacred. And then people just gradually, nonchalantly get to heaven and write a big book about it. and It's all lies. They did not go to heaven. Or people that went to hell, they're lying to you. When you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Or, or to go down into Hades where you'll be held for the final judgment. There's no escape in once you die. Once It says no man can retain his spirit. God knows the last day you're going to be on this earth. And when your spirit leaves your body, it doesn't come back to your body. It's all lies. But it's good stories, though. When they tell you, you know, I, I went to heaven and Jesus says, it's not that not t time to come back yet. So you need to come back later. And <laughs> it's all lies. Same as the prophecy today. I'll explain what real prophecy is in Scripture. The stuff you're seeing today is false. And I'll prove it by Scripture. Anyway, so let's keep going. It's a circus of the flesh to deceive you thinking they are special and God speaks through them. Or, or God speaks to them daily. You hear a voice and God's telling me to tell you this. It's all lies. Um, because of their lies and their visions and trips to heaven and hell, they seem above the crowd, specially chosen, full of the Holy Spirit. Because people think God spoke to them outside of Scripture. This is the most important thing you should understand. God's Word is final authority. Scripture is perfectly written. It's a perfect canon of Scripture. Men of God were driven or led by the Holy Spirit to write the words of God. And it's, it's closed. There's no more add into Scripture. There's no more hidden revelation above and beyond Scripture. Everything you do has to line up with Scripture, else disregard it. This is so important, you understand. It's Scripture alone is the foundation. If it goes beyond Scripture and it's not in Scripture, it's a lie. It's disregarded. It. It's false teaching. It's false prophecies. It's lies. I call these people pimps of the pulpit. Same as a pimp on the street, you know, who, who has a prostitute. They had to pay him money to get customers. That's what these people do. They're, they're using God's word to rob you of your money and teach you lies. And they're pimping God's word. And they're going to be judged in the last day. There are wolves that will tear you apart. Selfish and greedy, lustful, and they stain the real gospel. They, they bring reproach to Christ. And they are the enemy of the cross. That's what they are. Uh, they make merchandise out of you. How many books and CDs have you seen pawned off on TV shows or on ministries? Where they're like, send us a gift and we'll send you a teaching five ways to the Holy Spirit, ten ways to heaven, how to teleport from here to there, on and on and on. It's all garbage. It's all lies. It's all false. But because you want to seek more beyond Scripture and you do not want to be content with what God's given you, the Word of God, you go seeking after these false teachers and false prophets. And the reason why is because you're full of the lust of the flesh. It's something you don't want to hear, but it's the truth. Because they promise you the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And our human nature gravitates towards that. That's why you bring these teachings into your churches, you bring them into your homes, you play them on your TVs and your radio, because you're only going after what's in your heart. So, they make merchandise out of you, they sell you books and CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays. It's funny how Jesus Christ didn't sell the Word of God when He came down on the earth. When He performed a miracle, He told everybody not to tell anybody. Yet today, every, as soon as you hear a miracle, there's, there's ministries that want to tell you the whole story and, and gain approval from somebody else's misfortune. You know, so like, you got a healing? Well, just come on our show and we'll give you a, a spot to talk about it. And it boosts their ministry, even though their ministry is dead. They bring people on to try to aff bring affirmation to false teachers and false prophets. It's, it's crazy. 
They sneak into Bible studies with their lies and their books and their videos, and they deceive small churches with their false doctrines and their errors. The leaders of these churches are blind because if they could get to the pastor of the church, they can get to the congregation. If the pastor's not diligent, what he brings into the church for study, everybody gets affected by it. It's such a dangerous thing. If you could strike the shepherd, the sheep will f flee. So Satan's goal is to strike the, the head and work his way down. He's not going to go after the congregation. Like You might get a couple of members gossiping and causing some discord, but he's, his real goal, Satan's real goal in this last day is to take it from the pulpit and work its way down. Because if he can get to the head, he's got everybody else. And it, our enemy is slick, you know. Anyway, so let's keep going. Matthew chapter 15, verses 13 to 14. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 15. Uh, verses 13 says, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. The devil is using them to deceive you. We must judge based on God's word. Simple believers must seek the scriptures to ask the Lord for discernment. Sometimes we must do our part before discernment is given by God. Now, I want to, before I continue on deep into these false prophets and false teachers, I want you to understand something. I believe we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, not of works. It's a free gift from God. So, but, but if, if you get involved in these things, you're going to pay for it. You might not pay for it eternally, but you're going to pay for it here on the earth. They're going to take your money that you save for your family and rob you. They're going to take advantage of your mind and twist it. And it's just damage to the body of Christ. They're going to take away precious time that you have on this earth to do what God wants you to do. You're only given so many years, and then that's it. And then comes the judgment. So he, Satan wants to get you off the path, get you distracted for you know, 15, 20 years involved in this false teaching and false prophets and these false churches. You need to value your time because you don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. So, And you shouldn't give any type of platform for these people. People that do these things deserve to be excommunicated out of the body of Christ. They do not deserve to stand on the pulpit, preach God's word, because they bring shame to God's word and reproach to Jesus Christ. So that the non-believers, they look in on the church and they think, what a joke these people are. But they do not represent the true believers in Christ. But yet, they got the platforms, they got the TV platforms, the radio stations, and the little guy... Like us, you and me, we're serving God and doing what the Lord wants. And these people are ruining it. They're like a, a thorn in uh, the, the side of Jesus Christ. You know, they're, they bring reproach to the word of God. Now, where their judgment lies, I'm not going to worry myself with that. But I really feel sorry for them when they die and stand in front of the Lord. And they blasphemed his name and his Holy Spirit and done all these wicked, evil things. It's not going to be good for them in the Day of Judgment. And it's not going to be good for anybody who casts their lots with false teachers and false prophets as well. So just, it's just a warning. doesn't mean you're not saved. Just you need to lose some discernment. So let's see, verse 3. Um, let's see here. We're going to go on to... Uh, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. So turn to Proverbs chapter 2, read 1 verse 9. Verse 1 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, this is how much you have to seek it, guys, to really understand. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord 
and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. Let me repeat that again. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. A man who walks uprightly before God, he will store up wisdom for you. Sound wisdom. If you do not walk upright before God, you're not going to get any of God's wisdom. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. Let me repeat that again. He is a shield to those who walk up uprightly. You want God's shield? Walk uprightly. This is You have to do your part. He guards the paths of justice, preserves the way of, the, of his saints. He's talking about us. We're the saints. Then you'll understand righteousness, justice, equity, and every good path. It all starts with the fear of the Lord. One departs from evil. If you gratify in your flesh, you're going to fall into these false teachers and false prophets. If you t turn from the flesh and walk according to the Spirit, you will have eternal life. The scriptures are so clear. If you are carnally minded, you are an enemy of God. And, um, but to be spiritually minded brings life, eternal life. But you have to choose. Are you going to walk in the flesh or are you going to walk in the spirit? So, And the only way you're going to have discernment is if you walk in the spirit. The only way you're going to have a shield to protect you is if you walk in the spirit. And the only way that you're going to get wisdom is if you fear the Lord and depart from evil. So, if you're not willing to do these things, then you must have shut this video off now because the rest of what I'm going to say is going to absolutely mean nothing to you. It's going to go right over your head. Verse 3 says, We need discernment as given by God by yielding and walking in the Spirit. Verse 7 says, He stores up wisdom for the upright, and He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. How do we walk in the Spirit? So, let's go to Scripture. I'm not going to tell you something that I think is right. Let's just go to the Word of God and let the Word of God speak to you. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8 and let's read verses 12 to 14. Romans chapter 8. If you got your Bibles, let's start at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the Spirit to death the deeds of the flesh you will live I don't know that's pretty pretty basic stuff any child can understand that verse 14 for as many are led by the spirit of God these are the sons of God so why do some people hear and respond to the truth while others are sucked into the deception and lies we're going to go into the deeper let's go deeper Turn to Galatians chapter 5 and let's read 17 to 26. That's Galatians chapter 5. Okay, let's wait for a second until you turn to that scripture. By the way, if you're not following me with the Bible, don't even bother watching this broadcast because I could tell you things that aren't true. You need to have your Word of God open if you're going to be listening to me. So get your Bibles open. Galatians 5, 17, 26. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, and fornication, and uncleanness, lewdness, envy, murders, drunkenness, revileries, and of like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me repeat that. Verse 21. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revileries, and like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, those who practice, 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 <laughs> practice such things, okay, will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we live in the Spirit, let us also, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. It's all about walking in the Spirit. Are you going to fulfill your flesh lusts? Or are you going to put to death the deeds of the body and live? Those who have the Holy Spirit will put to death the deeds of the flesh and live. It's very simple. There's a scripture Jesus said 
this proves the point. I'm not going to just use this scripture. Usually there's many scriptures that back each other up. Jesus Christ said exactly, In that day many shall, many shall say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? And do all these wonderful things in your name? And Jesus is going to turn to them and say, I do not know you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The word lawlessness in the Bible is sin. To keep practicing sin. What is sin? Verse 21. Envy, murders, drunkenness, robberies of like, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if you have Jesus Christ confessed on your lips or not. It has to do with, are you born again? Do you have God, Jesus seed in you? Or do you live according to the flesh? You have no fear of God. Like You wouldn't do these things if you feared the Lord. You wouldn't prophesy false teachings or false prophecies saying, the Lord told me, or I had a dream, or... You know, I've heard prophecies like somebody like America's gonna be prosperous and the uh, pandemic thingy is gonna, you know, end at a certain time. These people do not fear God because none of the stuff they say comes to pass. They are false teachers and false prophets. And they are part of this group. And you look at the way they live, they're full of excess and indulgence. They are deceived. They are not, they're the ones that are gonna be saying, Lord, Lord, did I not do this? Or did I not do that? But I'm not here to judge people. So you can figure out who these people are just by examining what I'm saying and com compared to what you see out there. I don't need to give names because the Holy Spirit will reveal this stuff to you and give you discernment. So let's see. Well, let's continue. Um, discernment will only come after you start walking in the Spirit and rejecting the impulses of the flesh. I'm not making that up. The Word of God says that. Those who are slaves to the flesh follow after false prophets and false teachers. They fill large churches and deceive and give their hard-earned money to the workers of Satan. They love what they preach. They promise the world and the fleshly desires and never preach on sin and repentance and what sin does to a person. You'll never hear that message coming from these pulpits. You only hear what God can bless you with, what God can give you, uh, breakthroughs, blah, 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 blah. There's nothing about the judgment of God, the repentance, living a holy life, walking uprightly, none of that. So let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and read verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. Let's see what the character of Satan is. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It also says, uh, there's another scripture that says that Satan, is a, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has come to give an abundant life. Satan likes to steal. So if you got that family savings in the bank... You know, and you're saving up for a retirement or for some family thing. And then you at least know one of these preachers telling you you need to give money to get a thing from God. They are stealing from you. They are workers of Satan trying to steal from you. When you earn money and you work a job, you should not be ashamed of the money you earn. It's yours. God gives it, God gives it to you as a blessing. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes... The labor under the sun is your reward that God's given you to enjoy. Therefore, enjoy it. No other man or woman should have, you have to feel guilty to give them money because they're not willing to work or sweat off their brow and they're willing to lie and use the word of God to deceive you and then you're going to give your hard-earned money to them thinking that you're going to get an answered prayer from God. It's such wickedness. It's such evil. They are working for Satan. It's 1 Peter 5 8. Be sober and be vigilant, vil because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. <sighs> Deception is everywhere. God is still in the business of testing his people. He doesn't tempt people, God never tempts anybody, but he does test. He wants to see if you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. I'll just quote, quote some quick scriptures here. Proverbs 
2 says, every, man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. Do not trust your own heart. Let the word of God teach you discernment and the fear of the Lord. Then you will stay away from these types of people because you'll be able to see what's going on. Deuteronomy chapter 13, um, I think it's 1 to 4. I'll let you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 13, 1 to 4. This is Old Testament now. This is not This is the law. But there are some examples in the Old Testament that we can live by. But remember, we're under grace, not law. If there arise among you a prophet and a dreamer of dreams, giving thee a sign and wonder, and the sign and the wonder comes to pass, so it actually comes true. Therefore he spake unto thee, saying, Let's go after other gods, which thou hast not known. Let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord God proves you to know whether ye love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. That's no different today with Jesus Christ. You shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commands, commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. Absolutely, that hasn't changed today as it did in the Old Testament. That verse 4. This scripture was written to the nation of Israel regarding false prophets. Have you ever wondered why these false prophets get away with lying in the name of the Lord today? And they keep doing it and do it over and over and over again. And they just seem to, the churches seem to grow and they seem to not get, get away with They seem to get away with it. They, you know, they live long lives and you wonder, like, where's the justice? I want you to know that God leaves these false prophets in their positions to test you, to see if you truly love the Lord your God. Remember that those who lie and take advantage of the simple will all stand at the judgment. Now what happens to them? I'm not going to comment because I'm not God. But it's not going to be well for them, people that do these things. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, 12. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 12. This is a reminder of what happens to these types of people. Verse 12 says, Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, yet surely I know it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before Him. It's not going to be well for those who do not fear the Lord when they die at the judgment. God is a consuming fire. He's holy and righteous and just and sinless. Even the children of Israel, when the, when uh, Moses said, "Sanctify yourselves and come before the mountain," and God will speak. This is just a summary. God showed up. Uh, the blast of a horn, of a trumpet, got louder and louder, and the mountain quaked with like molten lava, and the people were scared. They ran back and said, "Don't let God speak to us. At least we could be consumed." And you know what the Lord said? He says. They're well to think of, uh, to say that, to fear me, because I have come that they may not sin against me. So you need to read that scripture and uh, the, see the result of God's presence in, in the, <laughs> the children of Israel. Yet people today use the Lord's name for this and that, and they say they have dreams and prophecies, and they have no fear of God. They, they don't understand because they don't see God that everything they do is written down in books and kept in heaven. And one day their life will be played before the Lord and those books will be opened and they're going to have to give an account of all those wicked and evil things they've done and how they've used and blasphemed the name of the Lord by doing all these things. I, I'm, I do not want to be there to see it, what's going to happen to them. It's The Bible says that God is a... Consume in fire. It, the Lord also says, Do not fear that man kill the body, but fear God who has the power to kill and cast both body and soul into hell. Fear Him. I don't understand how people can do this stuff today. This is all part of the last days, guys. Jesus Christ is about to return. 
So let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, read 4 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you got your Bibles, I'm going to start at verse 4. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Um, I want you to understand that discernment is a gift from God. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, because wisdom comes from God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I just add that, but that's in Proverbs. Anyway, so let's continue. To another word, knowledge, and the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. Interesting. So God gives measures of faith to perform certain tasks. All comes from God. Hmm. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. So I believe there's still healings going on. right? God gives the gift of healing. Not the way it's propagated today, but it's... it's uh, because what you're seeing today is, is the false, right? The real healings. God does still heal. He does perform miracles. I've heard some wonderful stories about people who have received healings. But they didn't go to a massive conference, a healing conference, to get it. They, they happen in, like, in their life. Just normal day-to-day -day people. So let's continue. Verse 10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. So there is still prophecy. But it's not the prophecy today. It's... And I'll get into the Word of God to explain what real prophecy is. And what you're seeing today is the false. To another discerning of spirits. Discernment. God gives you discernment to, to be able to spot these people. To be able to know the difference between the right and wrong. Between false teachers and false prophets and the real. To another diverse kinds of tongues and to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, divide into every man severely as he will. So God gives these gifts on his will. Not you can't conjure these gifts yourself. They come from up above. God gives them and distributes them as he sees fit. So let's uh, turn to Romans chapter ten and read seventeen. It's only one verse I'm gonna read. Now Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now in, in verse 17, this is in context to preaching the gospel. If you read the whole chapter, it talks about a man. God says that the, the field is plenty, but the laborers are few. And then it goes on and it says, uh, How will people hear the gospel unless somebody send a preacher? And... Uh, and unless they tell the gospel, they won't be saved. How can they get faith if they don't hear the word of God? God sends us out and commands us to preach the gospel to the lost. And when we preach the gospel, the very word of God coming out of our mouths is, is builds faith in the hearer. And the hearer hears it, and God uses that faith to save them. It's, it's, but he needs a preacher man to go out forth and preach the gospel. That's why Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This isn't a scripture to get things from God, like a better job or your health or healing or or uh, prosperity or whatever they got, that garbage they preach. Always read the scripture in context. This scripture, faith, is saving faith to a, to a wicked person, an evil person who doesn't know Jesus Christ, who hears the gospel gets faith from the Word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And when a human being repeats God's Word out of his mouth to a non-believer, the Word is powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It goes forth and it does not return void, the Scripture says. So you send out the Word of God and share the gospel of your salvation to people and it gives them a little bit of faith to get saved. That's how it works. But if they don't have a preacher, man, they'll never get the faith. Somebody has to go to them and tell them the good news of the gospel. So let's see, Proverbs 8, 7 says, For my mouth will speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. 
Proverbs 12:17 says, "He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit." So when somebody doesn't speak the truth of the word of God to you and twists it, my Bible says, "But a false witness deceit. They are deceitful. They are liars." Without truth, all that remains is lies. When uh, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Jesus came to proclaim, proclaim the truth. Satan is the liar. Jesus is the truth. So you got to remember that even though a person, if you meet a person and they're kind and they're humble and they're soft-spoken, but they teach lies and twist the word of God, they are a false witness and they're teaching deceit. Do not be deceived by the outward appearance. Always look into the heart. Look to the Word of God. The Scripture must be your foundation, your rock, to know. Because if you look at a person and they're kind and considerate and nice and lovey-dovey and you don't know your Word, you're going to get sucked in and deceived. There's a lot of nice people out there that don't know Jesus Christ. And then there's a lot of people who follow Jesus who are uh, nice people too. But you, you can't discern based upon how they conduct themselves or how well softly spoken they are or how many friends they have or how kind they are. These are all deceptions. You need to go to the root, to the Word of God. And if they're speaking lies out of their mouth that do not line up with the Word of God, they are teaching deceit. It's very simple. We are not to judge people, but we are to judge for ourselves only, to keep us from false teachers and false prophets. You need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord, not somebody else's. So these words I'm sharing you today are for you alone, not to go tell somebody else that they need to change or do this or that. You need to prepare yourself because when you die, Heaven is like a turnstile. It's like a hotel door. You go through the door and only one person can go in at a time. And you will be the only one standing in front of God at the judgment. And you will give an account. Nothing else is going to matter. You can't tell the Lord, well, so-and-so told me this or come up with these excuses. It's not going to work in front of God. You're going to be alone. So you need to make uh, walk your walk with God with holy reverence and fear and depart from evil. Whether the other people around you do it or not, that's not your responsibility. You just need to not partake in what they're doing. That's so important. Don't judge people. But consider your walk before the Lord. God will judge them. He's more than able to judge other people. The Bible says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You just need to love them. But don't partake in their deeds. Do not give them a platform in your life. Do not walk with false prophets and false teachers. And do not take their teachings and share them to other people because you're not going to be guilty in front of God. If you cast your lot with these people, you're going to be part of them. And I'm going to prove this. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, Listen carefully to this, okay? These are just examples and stories for us to follow. But this is all Old Testament. But the Lord Jesus uses these in the New Testament as examples. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, God sent two angels into the city to remove righteous Lot and his wife and daughters before the fire fell and destroyed the wicked. Pay attention to what happened to Lot's son-in-laws that stayed and perished. Nobody talks about this today on the pulpit. God warns not to partake in their deeds or you'll be swept away with them. It's no different than guilt by association. But the Lord, I don't mean that in such that you're going to be accountable for their sins. But like if you say you're on a boat, right? And, uh, or I don't know how to explain this. Say you're like going to rob a bank, right? That'd probably be a better description. And you're in the getaway car, and that bank robber shoots somebody in the bank. 
runs into the car, gets in the car, and you guys drive away, and then you get arrested by the police, you're going to be convicted of the same crime as the bank robber because you helped in the crime. And now, if that's human justice, can you imagine what God's justice is going to be for people who stand with false teachers and false prophets? God is way more just than we are. And his judgment is beyond what our judgment is. So God is perfect in his judgment. I do not know exactly how far this is going to go when people stand in front of the judgment. But if you fear the Lord, you won't be part of those people. Because, so let's keep reading. Like I said, it's not, it's not you're going to be accountable for your own sins as well as mine. I'm going to be accountable for my own sins, and you're going to be accountable for yours. I'm not going to pay for your sins. Every man shall stand alone in front of God. And I keep repeating this because I want you to understand something. that Who you listen to, who you absorb in your mind, who you put in your heart, the people you walk with, the things you partake in, all of these things are going to come back to you. And God's going to hold you accountable. Not them, you. So let's continue. Turn to Genesis chapter 19, and we're going to read 12 to 16. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whoever you have in the city, take them out of this place? So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But his sons-in-law he seemed to be joking. I'm sure you've heard Jesus Christ is coming back. And this time he's coming back to judge the world of sin. You tell people that they need to repent and turn from their sins because judgment is coming. And they, they take it lightly like, ah, you must be joking. We got time. What you're saying is not true. You know, they, they're taking it lightly. So let's see, verse 15. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry and said, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters, who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. Verse 16. And he, while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and his hands of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful to him, they brought them out and set them outside the city. You notice there's two people missing out of this whole equation? The sons-in-law of, or the husbands of the wives of the daughters, the husbands' daughters or whatever, they didn't go with them because they didn't fear God. And they took what Noah said lightly. And what happened to them? They, got, they perished. They were burned in the flames. So these are warnings for us today. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 5 and read 31. So that's Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31. And the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? With a question mark. God's people love to listen to false teachers and false prophets. Why, you ask? Well, because they themselves are full of the lust of the flesh. And they gravitate to those who give them what they want. It's in our nature, guys, to, to go the way of the flesh. When somebody's teaching you something in the pulpit, and it sounds good to the flesh, you're going to gravitate towards it. Nobody wants to hear repenting of sin, living a holy life. They only want to hear what God can give them, you know. The blessings of God, how they can get you a better job, a better car, a bigger house. But they don't want to, you know, have to suffer persecution for Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel, taking the time to, to love people enough to tell them the good news, uh, repenting of their, of their sexual sins or pornography or whatever they've got going on in their lives. Like, the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of people in the church are suffering from these things. And uh, they should not even be named among you as a believer. But 
And the scriptures are clear what happens to people that practice things like that. They may get away with it in private, but when they go stand in front of God, according to my word, they're not getting into heaven because they said those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom. And I believe that when Jesus Christ's seed remains inside of you and you're born again, you cannot keep on sinning without the Holy Spirit convicting you. If you're not having conviction for your sins, then you're not His. Because the Bible says that to whom the Lord loves, He, he, he uh, chastens and scourges. Else you would be an illegitimate son. So He corrects His, his own children. And it's not good when you get corrected by God. But it yields the fruit of righteousness. So if you're living in these, these lifestyles and you're hearing no conviction from God, then you got to ask yourself a question. Do you really even have the Lord? Because if you truly did, you wouldn't do these things. So, But only the Lord knows the heart. And like I said, I'm not here to judge. But for me, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will honor God in my body. Whether you do with your body is your business. But there are scriptures that say that you are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells inside you. For you were bought at a price. Therefore you need to honor God in your body, in your spirit, which are His. I didn't say that. God said it. It also says that a man who, dis who pollutes his temple of God, or pollutes the temple of God, God will destroy. He will destroy your flesh. And uh, there are scriptures that say that He'll destroy your flesh to save you in the last day. Like, um, I think it was Apostle Paul that said they would hand him over to Satan to the destruction of his flesh so that he may be saved in the last day. So some Christians who do not learn or listen to God's rebuke and are chastened by him and they keep refusing the correction, God will take them out of this earth early as a punishment. He's not going to let you stay in his vineyard he, like there's a scripture that says uh, when the Lord s saw the tree it was withered it's a parable and he said, uh, he said cut the tree down and the servant said let me dig a ditch around it water it feed it and after the third I think it was the third year if it still does not bear fruit then you can cut it down so God will take you if you're withered and broken, full of sin, and he'll try to restore you and try to get you to change, to turn to righteousness, to listen to him, to obey God through Jesus Christ. But if you keep refusing and refusing, your life will be cut short. God will take you out of his vineyard because you are that tree in the vineyard. That parable is about Christians. Anyway, Let's keep going here. Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name of which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now, this is Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. But these sins are so severe to God that they deserve death, okay? This is why people don't understand. They don't fear God when they do this stuff. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if that thing does not come to pass, that is the thing in which the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You should not be afraid of him. A person who speaks in the name of the Lord and keeps doing it, and shows no fear of God. That person doesn't deserve to be standing on a pulpit in a church. That person deserves to have their church taken away. Their members turning their back on that person. That person should be dumping sackcloth and ashes on his head. In reverence, in, in respect for the Lord, saying, Oh God, I've sinned so bad. But that's not what you're seeing today with these false teachers and false prophets. Because they don't have a fear of God in them. You cannot say the things they say and teach the things they teach and be endowed by the Spirit of God. So, anyway, let's continue. Let's turn to Jude. Read chapter 1 of Jude. And we're going to read 5 through 19. Hopefully I'm not. this teaching isn't too long here. I spent a long time studying this and writing this out. Okay. Verse 5. 
But I want to remind you, though you knew, once knew this, that the Lord, having saved his people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness of judgment of the great day. Verse 7. In Sodom and Gomorrah, there's the example again, Sodom and Gomorrah. And the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality. Or let's repeat, let's, re, let's just change that to pornography. Okay, let's make it today's thing. Have gone after strange flesh, that's homosexuality. Let's convert this to today, okay? And are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Hmm. Suffering what? Eternal fire. Likewise, these are dreamers defile the flesh. Dreamers. How many dreamers have you seen on YouTube say they had a dream that the Lord spoke to them? Interesting. There's no fear of God today. They defile the flesh, reject authority, speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring a, a, against him a violent accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil, whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Number 11, verse 11. Hmm. So, Cain. Everybody knows the story of Cain and Abel. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were thrown out of the garden. First murder was Cain rose up against Abel and slew his brother. But before he slew his brother, they brought sacrifices before the Lord. The Lord cursed the land when Adam sinned and said that it shall not bring forth its strength. By the sweat of your brow, you shall till the land. So Abel brought an animal sacrifice, which wasn't cursed. Cain brought the best of the land, which was cursed. And that's why God rejected Cain's sacrifice, because he brought cursed things before the Lord. And what the Lord said to Cain was, when he rejected his sacrifice, he says, why is that countenance fallen? If you just do what is right, it'll be good. But be careful, because sin lies at your door. And this is a warning to us today. It's no different than Cain. Because sin lies at your door, and its desire is to rule over you. But you must master it. Jesus Christ gives us the word of God and the truth. We must put the word of truth in our hearts and in our minds, so that when temptation comes, we can quote God's word and know and fight back and have victory. That's why Jesus used the word of God in the desert and against the devil when he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights without when he didn't eat or drink. He used scripture to defend himself. And Satan was slick enough to use scripture against Jesus. But he used the word of God. That's how you overcome temptation. Temptation doesn't come from God. It comes from your own sinful lusts in your body. But God says he'll provide a way out. So you don't have to fall into temptation. But you need to understand, you must master the things in your life. So, like... People who don't master eating lots of food, they become gluttons and 600 pounds. People who do not master uh, a good work ethic become poor if they don't hold a job. Uh, there's certain skills you must master in, in this world. Laziness, if you don't master it, it poverty will come upon you. Um, drugs and alcohol, same thing. There's one person who can drink a beer and be fine, not drink for the rest of the year. But then another person, that becomes their master. And it engulfs them, and then it kills them. And sin is lying at the door of every human being. Even today as I speak. If you're a Christian, sin's lying at your door. And its desire is to master you. But you must rule over it. This is the Lord speaking to us. So anyway, let's continue. Um, where were we here? Okay, so Cain, what about Balaam? Balaam, ba Balak, the king Balak in the, in, the, in the Old Testament wanted to curse the children of Israel. 
and he offered Balaam lots of riches to do it. And Balaam could only speak the words of the Lord. So every time he went to the God, God said this, he had to bless the people. He couldn't speak a curse against the people. And eventually, Balaam loved the money more than he loved God. This is what it means, the heir of Balaam, for profit. He served God for profit. He didn't serve God. He went for the king, king of uh, Balaam, Balak the king, because of the money. So he come up with a scheme and said, you know what, if they just send the, the beautiful daughters of the kingdom of Balak out into the children of Israel and they marry and they have sex with them, they'll worship their idols and the Lord will turn his back against the Israelites. And that's exactly what happened. But the spirit of Balaam looking for money. There's so many people in the body of Christ that serve God only to get what they want out of his hands. This is the error of Balaam that it's talked about. And they perished in the rebellion of Korah. Korah wanted to, did not want to follow Moses, God's chosen prophet. And Korah's rebellion caused fire to come down and devour, devour them. And then it also caused the earth to open up and devour everybody who disagreed with the judgment of God. And um, they were swallowed up in the earth and the earth closed up. The act of rebellion is witchcraft, it says in Scripture. When uh, King Saul did not obey Samuel's command to kill all the Amalekites and everything, he kept the best cattle and the King Agag, uh, Samuel said, rebellion is as the act of witchcraft. So, rebellion, God hates rebellion. And he's going to put it down. And it's a wicked, evil sin. And it caused lots of people to perish in the desert with Moses. So you have one that serves God for riches, one that has a rebellious heart towards leadership and God, and the other one is Cain because he did not approach God the way the Lord showed him to. He said, come to me with this way, and he wanted to come the, the, his own way to worship God, and God sh said, I do not accept it. And then he murdered his brother. How many people today want to serve God in a church? The, 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 the way of Cain is, is like this. Okay, guys? Have you ever seen Timothy? First Timothy that talks about the way the church should be run? When God... Let's go back to Moses. When Moses... The Lord said, set up the tabernacle after the pattern in heaven with everything that was to be set up. And Moses obeyed and followed exactly what was to be done. When Aaron was the priest... They had a big argument, and, and I think two of his sons came before the tent of Eden and wanted to offer fire before the Lord. And it's a story in the Bible. I'm not sure where it is, but I read it. And um, they said, bring your fire before God, and we'll bring our fire, and God will choose which fire is acceptable. And they were burned alive at the tent of Eden. And God, Moses, God told Moses to tell Aaron, do not mourn for your sons. Because of their disobedience, at least you die. So he watched his sons burn alive because they brought their own fire before God and tried to worship God their way instead of his way. How are we doing that today in the apostate church? You have women pastors and women teachers in the church. When the scripture clearly says that um, a pastor should be a husband of one wife and a deacon should be a husband of one wife. A woman should not teach or stand as a pastor in a church. They are fallen in the way of Korah and the way of Cain. The exact same thing that's happened, and God's going to reject it. He's not going to allow it. He's, he's, if these people perished for rebellion against God, how to approach Him in worship, we are commanded to run our church a certain way in Scripture. What gives us the right to do exactly what these people did to Moses? It's no different in God's eyes. It's actually a blasphemy for a woman to be a pastor of a church. I don't care how kind and friendly she is and how much she thinks God chose to call her. The spirit behind it, God's going to reject anybody who comes to worship him their way. He wants you to approach him his way. This is, this is what's going on. This is the last day church we're living in, the apostasy that you're seeing. 
So these are, let's continue on verse 12. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars, for whom they reserve the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who committed, who are ungodly among them, and all of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all their harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers and complainers walking after according to their own lust. They mouth great swollen words, flattering people to gain advantage. Verse 16. Let's stop there for a second. Grumblers and complainers. That's exactly what the children of Israel did before they entered the promised land. They were not allowed to enter. They constantly complained and grumbled against God. God hates this sin. You need to be thankful for everything you have in, in Jesus. And when you're having a bad time, you need to go back and remember what the Lord did in your life and dwell on that. You are not to complain and grumble about your life. It's evil. It's wicked. And they walk according to their own lusts. So they're so full of adultery and fornication and drugs and alcohol. and They do not live holy lives. They mouth great swollen words. People in the pulpit, or these false teachers and false prophets, they tell you great three things. Great swollen words. And they flatter the people to gain advantage. So they're, they're, they're manipulating people to gain advantage. And their advantage is to steal your money, is what they're doing. To make profit out of you. To make uh, merchandise, I guess they call it, in, in the scripture, out of you. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own godly, ungodly lusts. They are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. So if you're walking after ungodly lusts and you're a sensual person, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Remember, God will convict and chasten those whom are His. If you're not experiencing that, you need to ask yourself, do you really know the Lord? Because according to the scripture, if you walk according to the spirit, you'll put to death the deeds of the flesh and you will live. So as we get close to Jesus' return, we must watch and prepare. And we must guard our ears and our eyes, our minds. So let's read Matthew chapter 7 and we'll go 15 to 20. So Matthew chapter 7. Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So they're going to have Jesus Christ on their lips. They're going to be part of the church. They're going to look like Christians. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns and figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bring forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bring forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherever their fruits, you shall know them. What happens to a rotten tree? God's going to cast it into hell, into fire. Even John the Baptist came preaching before Jesus showed up and said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For the axe is already laid at the root of the tree. When he talks about trees in the Bible, he's talking about us. The axe is already at the root of your body. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Or he's going to cut you down. It's We are in the last days, guys. If you do not have a fruit of repentance in your life, he's going to cut you down. So how do we test, how do we do the fruit test for these charlatans? So what do false prophets and false teachers love most? Obviously money and positions of power. These false teachers and false prophets, they pervert faith. They always use faith and twist it 
it's, it's pretty sad. They teach to commit a vow of faith or sow a seed of money. They say that seed is needed to prove your faith for God. It's kind of like an activation, you know, you got to activate God to sow money for your answered prayer. It's such lies. The seed you must sow is money, and it always goes to them. You know, they always say, like, you know, you got to get to that phone and sow that seed. You know, you're running out of time, and they make you feel like, you know, you're going to lose your opportunity. Like, they're liars. They're pulp. They're pimps. They're not Christians. They're workers of the devil. And what is the devil? The devil is a, a liar. He's a murderer, and he steals. So what they're doing is they're stealing off of you. They're stealing your hard-earned labor and your money, which you deserve to spend on yourself and enjoy with your family. They're taking it out of your wallet, and they're using it for their lusts, and they're robbing you and because they're doing what Satan tells them to do. And they're using the Word of God to do it. It's, it's pretty evil. Anyway, uh, let's go on and say... The word of the seed is the word of God, of the gospel, which is sown into people's lives. Jesus talks about the parable of the seed and the sower. You know the one that says the seed was fell among the path, and the birds came and ate the seed. Some seed was fell on among the stony ground, and it grew, and the sun came up and withered it, and it died. The plant. Some seed was fell among the thorns, thistles. And it choked the seed and it didn't produce anything. And then some seed fell upon good soil and it produced a crop. The seed is the word of God. It's not money. It's the word of God. When you sow the word of God, when you go out and preach the gospel to somebody, this is what the parable means. You preach to a non-believer. Satan immediately takes the word out of their heart and they perish. They die along the path. When you sow the word of God to somebody else, out in the community and you talk to somebody some people accept it with joy and when the persecution comes they get offended and they fall away and they perish they get offended because the Lord says that you're going to get persecuted when you become a believer but they, they're not they don't have any root or any depth so that they fall away they get offended and fall away the seed that was sown among the thorns are like many Christians or so called Christians today that hear the word and then the cares and the riches of this world choke the word or the seed and it produces nothing. And they die and they don't get saved. They end up in hell because they never bore any fruit. They, their seed died. They got choked out. And the seed that was sown on good soil, those that hear the word of God and with a good and obedient heart, they persist until they bear fruit. And they produce 20, 10, 20, 30, 50. But they obey the Lord they have a heart to follow God that's what that parable means it has nothing to do with money it has to do with the gospel anyway um, and to prove my point you might not believe that those who got choked out by the thorns perish there's another parable Jesus said when a man holds a banquet the king holds the banquet he says send out the servants and invite them to my wedding banquet. So he went to them, and one person had an excuse and said, I had a, a yawk of oxen that I have to take to market. I cannot come. Another one said, I just got married. I cannot come. And they, they all had excuses not to come to the, the king's banquet. So the king heard it was angry, and he said, go into the highways and the byways and invite anybody you can. And then when he went in to see the guests, he saw a man that didn't have that wedding garment on. And he said, how did you get into here? And he said, he was speechless. And he says, bind that person, hand and foot, cast them into outer darkness, or they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As for those who were invited, they, are, they will not taste my supper. They will not, in, you will not get to heaven. If you choose your job, your wife, your things, your belongings over God, you will be like the man who was sown the seed that was sown among the thorns and the thistles. You will perish. That's the whole purpose of the parable. The three people, the one on the path, the one on the stones, and the one on the thorns, they perish. 
Only the ones that are sown in good soil are the ones who are saved. That's why Jesus says, Many will try to enter into eternal life, the narrow path, and will not be able to go in. Very few people will enter into eternal life. Because you have to give up everything in your life. Jesus said, unless you deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. You're not going to get saved unless you deny yourself and take up the cross. Jesus says, unless you love me more than your wife or your mother, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, or even your own children, your own direct wife or family or your children, you're not worthy to be my disciple. You must put God as number one and everybody second. You must, that's why sometimes Christianity is a lonely path because it requires, you might lose everybody in your life following Jesus Christ. But if you desire to lose your life here for Christ's sake, you'll gain it in eternity. But if you decide to keep your life here, keep your family and friends and everything and you want their approval and you don't care, you're willing to compromise, you're not going to have eternal life. Jesus Christ is very clear that you must put him as number one. You must deny yourself, turn from your sins, turn from your flesh. Walk a holy and upright life in front of God. Fear him, depart from evil. And the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, will wash you of your sins. And you'll have eternal life. Let the word of God speak to your heart, guys. Don't, don't believe me. Go study what the Lord says in His Word. Because there are many teachers out there that will tell you things you want to hear. But the truth is, go get your truth from the Word of God. Don't get it from, from me or even other people. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. Anyway, let's go on to uh, Matthew chapter 23. Verses 25 to 26. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 23. This is important. It's not the outside that matters, it's what's on the inside. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Some scripture says excess. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside of them may be clean also. So to spot a false teacher or a false prophet, it's a look at a life of excess in their life. It's a dead giveaway. Or even a carnal Christian can have those type of things going on in their heart. It's not going to church that saves you. It's what's in your heart. Where do, where do you default to on your spare time? Do you go watch, like, do you listen to dirty music and watch dirty movies and are getting drunk with alcohol and smoking drugs and having sex out of marriage and whatever you're doing and then you come back to church and you put your hands up and say I'm a, I'm a believer and then everybody sees the outside they see oh yeah he's dressed in a nice suit and tie and then he goes and defaults back into his old ways those who practice the lifestyles like that are deceived and they're going to be banging on the door saying Lord Lord and he's going to say, I do not know you. Depart from me, you who practice wickedness or lawlessness or sin or whatever. Because there was no true repentance in their life. It's like the ten virgins, the five wise virgins and the five foolish. The five wise had oil in their lamps. They were ready, even though they all slept and slumbered as the time passed, because the Lord delayed his coming. When the, bride, the call of the bridegroom came, they all woke up and they all lit their lamps and the five wise virgins had enough oil and the, the five foolish virgins weren't ready and they begged the five wise virgins to give them some of their oil and they says no at least we run out ourselves but go into the town and buy some and while they went back into the town to buy some the bridegroom came and the door was open and they went in and the, and the door was shut and the five foolish virgins came banging on the door saying, Lord, Lord, let us in. And he opened up the door and he says, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me. So it will be for everybody who does not watch and prepare. If you're living a life of sin and wickedness, you need to wake up and start watching. 
because our Lord is about to return. You need to turn away from these false teachers and false prophets. You need to turn away from your wicked sins. You need to repent. You need to walk upright and holy before the Lord and obey His word. You need to have oil in your lamps, is what I'm saying. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, read 1 through 3. I'm, no, I'm sorry this is such a long teaching, guys, if you still manage to stay watching this. But I spent a long time studying this, and this is on my heart. 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, even though there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, of whom the truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you. Which means they're going to take your money and exploit you, because they covet. With deceptive words, for a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. People who practice these type of things in the church, God has a special destruction and judgment for them. So deep darkness will await the people who covet other believers' money. They try to use the word of God to steal people's earnings. It, you would be better off just going into breaking into a car than going to God's church and do it. Because <laughs> the judgment is going to be worse for the believers or so-called believers that do this in the church than those who do it outside the church. You know, there's a scripture that says, you must come to the God like a little child, for such is the kingdom of heaven. If you offend one of these little ones, that's any believer in the church who's truly a born-again believer, if you offend them, it's better that you tie a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the, to the sea, because that's what the judgment's going to be like for you. You're messing with God's people. You're messing with God. Like, <laughs> I really feel sorry for you if that's the way you've went. You've tried to pip out people by God's word. Using God for profit. You're in for a rude awakening at the judgment. Let's see here. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, 4-11. to Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. And we'll start at verse 4. Here's a warning again. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down into hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the, the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. If you live like these people, this is what's going to happen to you, okay? And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds, which means they were homosexuals. That's what they were doing. Men with men, women with women. Uh, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. Just like Moses with Korah, right? Do you honor God's authority? This all goes back to like women preachers and women pastors in the church. And God sets up his word to establish his church of worship. And you don't care about it. This is exactly what's going to happen to you. And to the churches that do this stuff, type of stuff. And let's continue. Those who especially walk according to the flesh the flesh and lust of uncleanness and despise authority. The word of God is authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They don't care about what God says or what his word says. They're willing to do what they're own. Whatever feels right in, in the 1990s or 2000, you know, because we need to go the way of the world. Well, you need to go back to the word of God is what you need to do. It's not about feeling. It's about God's authority. God's word is authority. They are presumptuous self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. 
Whereas angels who have the greater power and might do not bring a rail in his accusation against them before the Lord. So this is what's going on today in the churches, guys. I'm sure you've heard this, people casting out Satan, binding him. This scripture is a warning because we're human beings and angels are more powerful than us. And yet we sit there and say, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. These people are exactly what what's talked about in the scripture. Not even the angels would do it. When they disputed with Moses' body, the angel said, the Lord rebuke you. The angel literally said, the Lord rebuke you. Not me rebuke you, the Lord. Yet today we go around thinking we can cast out Satan out of people. It's absolutely ridiculous. But that's what that scripture means, by the way. Anyway, so Exodus 4.11 says, so the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, and the blind? Have not I the Lord? What's going on today in the churches is some people say uh, if you're sick, you're sinning, or if you're lame, you must be judged by God. I'm sure you've heard this message saying, you know, you've lost your child, you must be sinning, or God's judgment's on you. But the scripture says that God is the one who creates the mute, the deaf, the seeing, and the blind. So if you're in a wheelchair and you haven't got a healing or whatever or you're struggling with something right now, you need to understand that God's going to use that to bring glory to his name. You know, you may get healed, but you may not. Only God knows. But do not believe that because you're in a wheelchair that you've sinned against God or that you've done something bad because that's what they're going to teach you, uh, the false teachers and the false prophets. And they don't understand that that God creates all types of people in their conditions. Anyway, so you always hear the saying, God wants you prosperous and fully healed. It's not true. It's a lie. Um, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 7. I read 21 to 23. This is the one I quoted earlier. Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23. This is a warning to people who practice a lifestyle of sin, okay? It's not what you say on your lips that matter. It's what you do with your life. You can speak Jesus, Jesus all you want to people and fool them, but you're not fooling God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name? and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. Pay attention to the last verse, guys. This is so important. You who practice lawlessness. You live a life of sin, of rebellion, you'll be shut out of heaven. That's Jesus' words, not mine. It comes down to what you do with your life regarding sin, that you master sin, and that sin doesn't master you. Like in the beginning when God said to Cain, sin crouches at your door. It's desirous for you and you must master it. If you yield to your flesh and let it master you until the day you die, you will die a second death. If you put to death the deeds of the flesh, which is your responsibility, not God's, and walk in the Spirit, you'll have eternal life. Let's keep going here. If Jesus remains in you, you will love what he loves. You will hate what he hates. You will obey him and do his will. Uh, let's see here. Another fruit of a saved person is one who preaches the gospel to other people. There are so-called Christians who sit in church and never share the word of God to anybody. They're disobeying the Lord. You need to go out and preach the gospel at any moment, at any time of your life, to anybody you know. You need to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation. This is a fruit that comes from a life full of the Lord. In your, like, But if you're full of sin and, and lust, you're not going to do these things. You're going to default back into the world. Try to blend in with the world, right? You don't want to cause waves or whatever. Like, James 4.4 4 says, James 4.4, 4, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is an enemy, 
enemy with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you're more worried about what people think about you, you're an enemy of God. You need to please the Lord and not people. James 5, 1-3 says, James chapter 5, 1-3, See how far I got left. I think I got like a quarter left to go here. Come now, you rich, and weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded. And the corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last day. Everybody's out to build up their own kingdoms. That's why Jesus said, Come out from among of the world and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And you will be my children, and I will be your father. We need to separate ourselves from the way the world's going. To love the things Jesus loves and hate the things Jesus hates. Second Peter 2, 18 and 22 says, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 18 for when they speak great swollen words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, by whom a person is overcome. Listen to this carefully. By whom a person is overcome, by him he is also brought into bondage. A slave. It's the same scripture that the Lord said. To Cain, sin lies at your door. Its desire is to rule over you, but you must master it. Let's look at the New Testament. For while they promise themselves liberty, they themselves are a slave of corruption. By whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if they after have escaped the pollutions of the world... Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit. And as so have him washed to her wallowing in the mire. One of the people that are left out of heaven are dogs. If you have a sin mentality, like a dog who eats his vomit, you need to repent and turn to Jesus Christ because you're going to be left out of the kingdom. The Lord convicts those and chastens whom he loves. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The church of the Laodiceans is a warning to the last day church. It's in the book of Revelation. People are living in this rich time. We have lots of abundant goods. But we are miserable, poor, and naked. So therefore, buy for... Actually, what it says is, To the church of the Laodiceans write, I know thy works. You are neither hot nor cold. But because you are lukewarm... I will spit you out of my mouth, or I will vomit you out of my mouth. For you say in your heart, I am rich and need of nothing. And little do you know that you are pitiful, poor, and naked. Therefore I counsel thee to buy of thee gold refined in the fire, and raiment that thou nakedness may be clothed, and I slav for your eyes that thou may see. To whom the Lord loves, he rebukes and chastens. Therefore be zealous and repent. These are warnings to the church. You need to repent from your wicked evilness. Turn to live a holy life for the Lord. Okay, let's continue. Mark 10, 21 says, Mark chapter 10, 21. Then Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. You need to put the Lord above everything in your life. That doesn't mean to physically go sell your house because you know you're gonna leave your family on the street. That's just 
what it means is you need to put God as number one in everything. So now you hear people say, you know, pro let's go to the prophecy. I mentioned that earlier in the scripture, in this teaching. How do you know real prophecy? This is what prophecy is. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 says, turn to Hebrews chapter 1, 1 to 4. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past by the fathers, by the prophets. So God spoke through prophets of the Old Testament. Has in this last day spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world's. And be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So Jesus gave visions and future events through prophets of old. But when Jesus Christ came and died and rose, the word of God was finished. It was completed. There's nothing to add extra to it. There's no new chapter you're going to find in the mountains to add to the word of God. It's, it's complete. It's closed scripture. It's final authority. So if you have a dream or a vision or a prophecy, it has to line up with God's word. Else it's not from God. That's important you understand that. So if you're coming up with something to say, the Lord told me to tell you this, and you got no scripture to back it up, you better be careful what you put to the name of the Lord. Same as a dream. If you have a dream that's not in scripture, it's not of God. You need to reject it. To understand what prophecy is now, listen to this. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 19.10 says, Always go to the Word of God for the interpretation. What is prophecy in the New Testament? This is what it is. And I fell at the feet to worship Him. And He said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Now pay attention to this line. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. To be a prophetic today is to go out and preach Jesus Christ to people. To reveal Jesus Christ in the scriptures that are already written. That is the pro prophetic. It's not what you're seeing today and what's going on in the world. If it does not reveal Jesus Christ, it's not of God. All prophecy should point to Jesus Christ. So when somebody says, you know, this nation is, is going to suffer from this, and this president is going to rise, and this president is going to fall... It's false teaching. It's false prophecy. These people are liars. They're from Satan. Only time prophecy is given is to the testimony of Jesus Christ. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All prophecy points to Jesus Christ. That's how you can determine whether it's real prophetic or whether it's false. This is discernment I'm giving you guys. You can study this, self, uh, study this yourself. Let's see what real prophecy is in the New Testament. We're going to go to the book of Acts and read chapter 8, 26 to 39. This is how the Lord works the prophetic. Difference between the Old Testament and the New. Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go forward south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. He arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship. While returning, sit in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Remember, prophecy points to Jesus. You're seeing, this is an example of prophecy, okay? Do you understand what you are reading? And he said to me, how can I, how can, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? 
Then Philip opened his mouth at the beginning of the, at the scripture and preached Jesus to him. This is the prophetic. It always points to Jesus. Anything that does not point to Jesus that you're seeing today is not prophecy. You need to disregard it. Have nothing to do with these people. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is some water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He, and so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he was baptized him. And then they came up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So the eunuch saw him no more, and he went his way rejoicing. Even Let's just prove this point. Even John the Baptist, when he, when he was to come before the Lord, before Jesus, John the Baptist was a prophet. What, what is prophecy again? It points to Jesus. What did John the Baptist do? Even John the Baptist was a prophet and he pointed to Christ. He made the way for the Lord, for the Lord. Notice the pattern of real prophets. They all point to judgment from God and the revelation of Christ's return or the Christ coming or to reveal Jesus Christ in Scripture. It all points to Jesus' prophecy. It has nothing to do with a government that rises and falls, a nation that goes to war and wins, or a hurricane that's going to pass through a city, or blah, 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 blah. That's all lies. They're lying to you. They are false teachers. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. Real prophecy only points to Jesus Christ. If you really want to know the true prophetic, always points to Jesus Christ. Okay? Anyway, so let's keep going. So if you have a pr prophecy in your church, and it points to Jesus... You need to accept it. If it doesn't point to Jesus, you need to reject it. That's that's the litmus test. Okay, that's what Hebrews chapter one means. Okay. Um. Let's see here. Second Timothy. Three twelve to thirteen says. Second Timothy ch chapter three, verse twelve to thirteen. Yes. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's going to be a division among those who serve the Lord and those who don't. You're going to have some believers who say they're believers and are not, are going to persecute the real believers. You know, because if you're of the world, the world would love you, your own. But because you're not of the world, they're going to hate you. So some people will hate me for teaching this on, on, on my channel. But I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11 says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to the teacher down the road. Don't listen to anybody but God's word. Okay, guys? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. As such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified. See, they changed. They were washed and they were sanctified. God got a hold of their hearts and they repented. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So God is a will put down all evil when he returns. There will be a separation between the wheat and the tares. And all the tares will be burned in the fire. And those who live lifestyles like 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 through 11 will be shot out of heaven. Regardless if you give Jesus lip service on your lips. Do not be like Lot's sons and laws who took Lot's warning as a joke in Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though they were married to the daughters of Lot, they still perished. Even his wife turned back and turned into a pillar of salt. They were examples of do not t put your plow hand on the plow for God and then turn back. Because if you turn back, you're not worthy of him. You'll perish. That's, that's what that meant when Lot's wife turned back. Jesus used that as an example. 
You need to come out from the world and start walking with the Lord and look forward, not look backward. This is a warning to believers or anybody who comes to Jesus not to go back to their old way of living. You will perish if, it ha if you do. We must come out from these groups of people who give platforms to false teachers and false prophets and have no fellowship with them. The simple who are deceived must leave their abode and come out from the wolves or they will perish when God's judgment falls in the future. By the lack of knowledge, my people perish is in Scripture. You need to be have discernment. But before you get into all this false teachers and false prophets, trying to figure out what's what, my best advice for you is to fear God, depart from evil, and pray for wisdom. And God will give you discernment. And then you will see everything that I've shown here today. And everybody around you in your life, and your teachers, the people, the books you read, even the things said going on in your church, and the words spoken and the videos you're watching, God will give you discernment and you will see the truth. And then you'll understand the difference between the right path and the wrong path. But it all starts with you. Do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body? Are you willing to fear the Lord and depart from evil? Because the fear of the Lord is the, is the beginning of wisdom. Now, we're pretty much almost done. I'm going to read this last verse. This is a warning in our day. This is written back in Jeremiah chapter 23. I want you to turn to Jeremiah 23, 16 to 40, and then we'll wrap this up. Verse 16 of Jeremiah chapter 23 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart. Not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, The Lord has said, You shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, No evil shall come upon you. For for who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived his his heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind, and it will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand. In the latter days. This is addressed to us, even though this is Old Testament. Read this, guys. In the latter days, you will understand. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from their evil of their doings. Am I a God near am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places and shall not shall so shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth? says the Lord. I have heard the prophets who has who said, who prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed and I have dreamed. What's going on today, guys? How many people have had dreams, you know, said that God spoke to them? This is all last day prophecy. How long will this be in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor, as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has dreamed a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire? God's word's like a fire, because he is a consuming fire, says the Lord. And like a hammer that breaks the rocks into pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Basically, this saying is people will pl plagiarize other people's teachings on, on uh, in the last days. So you'll hear of churches taking other sermons from other people and then using them. 
It's called plagiarism. This is what's going to happen in the last day. And that's how you know these false teachers from false prophets. Okay, so. Verse 30, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, He says, Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. So when these people or the prophet or a priest ask you, What is the oracle of the Lord? You shall then say to them, What oracle? I will even forsake you, says the Lord. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people who say the oracle of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. I don't understand what that means by punish, but it's going to happen. Thus every one of you shall say to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What has the Lord answered? And what has the Lord spoken? And the oracle of the Lord shall be mentioned no more. For every man's word will be his oracle. For you have perverted the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus you say, shall say to the prophet, What has the Lord answered you? And what has the Lord spoken? But since you say the oracle of the Lord, the, therefore the Lord says, Therefore thus says the Lord, because you say this, his, this word, the oracle of the Lord, and I have not, and I have sent to you, saying, Do not say the oracle of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and forsake you, and the city that I gave you and your fathers, and will cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, and a perpetual shame, which will not be forgotten. So I will end with this, guys. If you do not know Jesus, and you want to receive Jesus Christ, I have a video called, Who is Thy Neighbor? It will appear at the end of this video. And uh, if you don't know Christ, Proverbs says, A man who forsakes his sin, confesses his sins and forsakes them, God will have mercy on that soul. It also says that God's throne is established upon mercy and truth. God's grace comes to all sinners. And he gives us grace time because the goodness of God or the grace of God leads a sinner to repentance. That's what scripture says. And it's by God's grace that we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a free gift from God, not of works, least any man should stand in front of God and boast. So you come to the Lord as a sinner. You lay down your sin. You approach him like the tax collector, humble, broken, contrite over your sin. Ask the Lord to come into your heart. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Forget them. Forsake them. Start walking. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Deny yourself. Love him more than anything in the world. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. He'll give you the ability to live a holy and godly life. But a believer that walks in the Spirit, God takes the Ten Commandments and writes them on the tablet of your heart. He's not done away with His commands. Instead, He transfers them from stone into the heart. And that you obey God when they're in your heart because He writes them in the tablet of your heart. So anyway, thank you for staying through this whole video. I know this was a long video, guys. I hope it opened up your eyes to false teachers, false prophets. We're, we're getting really close to the coming of the Lord. I'm so excited. I can't wait. The, the more you hear on the news about the world and how bad it's getting, that just means Jesus Christ is even closer than we know. So God bless, and uh, hopefully I can come up with another video sometime soon. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pastor or anything. I'm just a normal person like you and me who loves God, and God's, God's word burns like a fire in my heart. And I just wanted to share this with you guys. Have a good day.